Lord, please be with us uh, through this worship service and so that we can have our hearts and our minds open to you. Lord, thank you for this time that we can spend with one another. Lord, we have a, a prayer request that we want to uh, bring up to you. Uh, Edna's friend, uh, she, was in the, she was hospitalized. She blacked out while she was driving. And we thank you, Lord, for her safety and that she is safe and, um, and recovering at the hospital. Uh, Lord, be with her, be with Edna, and through her surgeries and um, the things that she's been going through medical, medical-wise. Lord, uh, be with those who aren't here to, this morning. Be with those who are traveling, those who are traveling to Murfreesboro. Be with the men there. Help them to get back safely. Lord, please be with us uh, as we gather to the, together to worship you. Help us to have our minds and our hearts focused on you. We pray, Lord, you be with the men who are um, presiding in the worship this morning as well. We pray in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Please stand up Thank you. 
morning, everybody. Good morning. This is our opportunity to, as the podium says, we we'll remember to be where we commemorate the Last Supper, the death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Now, last week when I uh, uh, assisted at the table, I, uh, I did discuss the uh, Last week when I was on the table, I did, I was intentional reaching out in my prayer, uh, mentioning that our Lord is our Redeemer. Thank you again. And, and, and it's not by accident. It's something that I just, for some reason, you know, you live your life and all of a sudden something catches your attention. And for the past month, the word Redeemer, you see there's uh, congregations out there that has their the church is named the great redeemer or redeemer in the name. We even sing songs, right? We have songs about the Lord being our redeemer. And I did some further research too. There in the New King James Version, there are 22 references to the word redeemer. All right, so it was, I thought, well, let me dig further, right? Because we say things and I don't know if you know the meaning behind it. So my dictionary, Redeem, I don't redeem. To redeem is to buy or pay off, clear by payment. To recover by payment or other satisfaction. To discharge or fulfill a pledge, promise, etc. To make up for amends, offset for some fault or shortcoming. <coughs> to obtain release or restoration of as for captivity by paying a ransom. Do the research, you find out, wow, I, can, I get it. You know, it's not just a word that we say. And that's what we participating in this act right now. We were redeemed by our sins, for our sins. Not that we deserved, not that we deserved it, not that we earned it, but through the awesomeness and the love of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And I want us to focus on that. Someone paid a ransom for us, for our sins. And with that, I'm going to ask uh, Brother brother Bob to offer the prayer for the Bible. Shall we pray? Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you in prayer at this time, thanking you for this fine day to worship you and commune with you, partaking of the emblems you have directed us to to partake in remembrance of your death on the cross. At this time, we ask that you bless us unleavened bread, which represents your body shed on the cross for our sins. We ask that you forgive us of our sins, O oh Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. As we continue to recognize the sacrifice for our sins, I'm going to ask Brother Terry to bring forth the prayer for the fruit of the vine. Dear Heavenly Father, I bring you this day to be able to come before you, worship you, and thank you, God, for the sacrifice that you made for us. Shed your blood, shed your blood on the cross. We are truly redeemed. So thankful for our sin. Amen. Amen. This concludes the Lord's Supper. Now, this is the time in the worship service that we have set aside for us to give of ourselves 
monetarily for the furtherance of the work of this body. With that, I'm asking you to bow your heads and pray. Our Lord, our Father in heaven, Lord, you bless us every day, every moment of our day. And for that, we're so thankful. We take this time right now to bring forth the material blessings that we need to further the work of your church. We know that as we do, we are blessed by our giving and we bless others. And we're so thankful that an act, this act that we can perform can be such a blessing to others. Through your son, Jesus, we offer this prayer of thanks again. Amen.
Good morning. The uh, scripture reading today is taken from the 14th chapter of John, verses 15 and 16. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. If you love me and keep my commandments, and I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper that he may abide with you forever. This is the reading of, of the gospel. Blessed in Jesus' name. Amen. Morning, everyone. Morning. Morning. Thankful for another Lord's Day. I love the scripture that says, I was glad when they said, let us go into the house of the Lord. And I'm really happy to be here physically with you. It's nice seeing you on Zoom and being with you on Zoom, but it's greater being here with you physically. Yeah, thank God for that opportunity. A couple weeks ago, I began a series that I'm going to continue on today. In fact, we went over another part of it this morning in Bible study. And the subject is love. I am convinced that love is the greatest subject in the Bible. And let me tell you why. Because of God's love for us, when we sin against us, him, he made provisions for us immediately, an act of love. He saw Adam and Eve with the little uh, leaves on them, thinking that that would suffice them, and told them that won't do. So he killed an animal and gave them the animal skin. When I look at my Bible, I begin to see a pattern of teaching us um, from that moment on to help us. And when I look at everything in the Old Testament, it has one big story of love to get to Jesus Christ, our Redeemer. And Herman, by the way, I think if a person grew up in the 50s and 60s like I did, they know exactly what redeemed me. Because I remember when I was a little boy, there were some Bibles I could redeem for two cents. Some bottles I could redeem for a nickel. And I would save all of the top bottles that I could so that I could redeem those bottles and get that change. <laughs> oh, yeah. So uh, that was a good, a good example because that's what God did for us. He redeemed us. His son bought us. His son paid for us. And that is an act of great love, especially for people that were against us. Last time on part one um, of love, I dealt with um, fear because you know how lambs are fearful. We're very fearful. And, and it's so funny because you listen to Jesus and the angels, I mean, come, went, went around human beings telling us, don't be afraid, don't be afraid, don't be afraid, over and over again. So we saw in the Bible that perfect love casts out fear. But we saw that perfect love is a gift from God. It's a gift that comes from God and it's only given to his people because of his love for us. Because he's not willing that any of us should perish, but that we all come to the knowledge of the truth. So his perfect love, he gave, in his perfect love, he gave us his spirit. He gave us the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit opens our eyes and teaches us not to fear. Our love is increased because of the work of the Spirit as the Spirit enlightens you and I. Our lives become better as a result of that enlightening. And we get to a point where we can understand what Jesus said when he says, do not fear men. Do not fear him who's able to destroy your body. 
I mean, it can do that. It happens all the time. In fact, I heard on news this morning that I think over the weekend, or at least last night, three people were, were murdered in Chicago last night. So a man, a man can take your body. But the Bible says there is one that we need to fear. It says fear him who can destroy both the body and soul in hell. That's right, brother. Don. That's right. And who was that? God. I, I teach my son, Philip. I, I am loving teaching him, but I realize that it is a job because every time I teach him something, the adversaries are trying to steal from him. And all of us parents, we know that. We have to be diligent about how we teach our children. So I, I have taught them not to be fearful. But today, what we're going to look at, and, and it was covered in the scripture reading, is love helps you and I to be obedient to the Lord. Jesus says, if you love me, keep my commandments. For the longest time, I didn't really understand it. And I won't tell you that I understand all the way, because every time I think I understand something all the way, the Lord teaches me that there's a little bit more of it. But I have a better understanding than what I did before, because that scripture used to bother me. It bothered me so bad forever, because I feel like I've always loved Jesus. But I wasn't keeping his commandments. And that bothered me. And I told you that even when I first became a Christian, it bothered me to the point where I would go home and I'd cry. And I'd ask God, what in the world is the matter with me? Why is it that I am having such a hard time doing the things that you told me to do? And I want to. But I tell you that I think that scripture is, is misunderstood. Very misunderstood. It's come to mean something different to me now. My obedience to the Lord is a consequence of love. It is not a testimony of my love. Do you understand what I'm saying? Because I come to services because I don't steal, because I don't kill, because I don't lie. Um, that's not the reason, that's not the reason, or that's not um, an indication of my love. Yet it is in a way. It is a consequence of my love. It follows as a result of my love for him. As a result of my love for him, it causes me to endure. As a result of our love for him, it causes you and I to understand that we've been redeemed, that we've been bought with a price, that we've been purchased by the blood of the son of the living God. It helps us to understand that God is working in our lives. And the Bible, is, it helps us to understand the value of God's word. Because the Bible tells us that he that began to work in you will finish it. And what I love the most about the Bible, I'm getting truth. I'm happy with that. Because God made it for people like me who sometimes can't figure out their left hand from their right hand. And he says, don't worry about it, Gene. Don't be afraid, Gene. I'm working in your life to turn you into the man that you need to be. I know what you want to be. But you just keep moving forward. Because the Lord is working in our lives. And as a result of that, it makes me love Jesus even more. And the more I love him, the more I want to do what he said. So it's a consequence of loving Jesus. I'm going to try to put this in one more way before we read the scriptures. A good parent, we like to use that phrase, so I'm going to use it. A good parent makes sure that their children are fed. Um, they teach their children the things that are right. They prepare their children. They try to educate them so that they can be successful in this world. 
And a real good parent would also make sure that they understand that there's a God who rules in the affairs of men. That um, will give them the knowledge that there's a God in heaven. So if I do all of those things, they are the result of my love. Not that I have signed up to be a good parent. Do you hear what I'm trying to say? Um, I love Eugene. I love Leah. And I love Philip. So therefore, because of my love, I provide for them the things that they need. I teach them the things that they ought to know. With you and I, the Lord has made a way for you and I. He has bought us with price. God loved us when we were his enemies. Jesus came and demonstrated the love of God to you and I on earth to teach you and I so that you and I can have that love in us. And if and while we have that love in us, it aids you and I in the way that we treat other people. And when I think about what he did for me, it makes me love him more and more. And when I realize what he gave up for me, I love him more and more. And when I look in the Old Testament and I see God's love demonstrated over and over and over to get him to the cross of Calvary, I just say, wow. And then when I see him getting ready to be beaten to death and hung on a cross, and you know what he's concerned about? Amen. Concerned about you and I. That's exactly right, brother. He's concerned about you and I. Um, Human beings don't normally do that. But our Lord did. And I look at him and with awesome, I look at his awesomeness. And I read in the Bible that he says, I do always those things that please my father. We're going to be reading here in a second, but I want you to think about these things before we get into the text. Even a comment that I had not really considered until I prepared this lesson. It's still ringing in my mind. Just one little thing that he said. Now, if you remember, let me tell you where he is right now before um, to deal with the, the scripture reading because the text is um, found in the scripture reading that you and I are looking at today. And so you can go ahead and turn, if you want, to the book of John, the 14th chapter. And we'll be reading there in a minute. He just got through instituting the Lord's Supper with his disciples. He's telling them he's going to die. He's telling them he's not going to be with them. He's telling them, I'm getting ready to go. He's preparing them for that. And he knows that they're hurting them. First verse of John chapter 14 says, let not your hearts be troubled because he's concerned about us. Let not your hearts be troubled. Someone who's getting ready to go through what he's getting ready to go through and to say that, or at the end of the uh, instituting the Lord's Supper, when they are arguing who's gonna be the greatest in the kingdom and he bends down and he washes their feet because he loves them. And always remember that the Bible tells us that God is love. So love is the greatest thing in the Bible. So he's about ready to pay the ultimate price for us. And his concern is us. Let not your hearts be troubled. Let not your hearts be troubled. That's how he starts. We're going to go back and read that in a little bit. But we're going to actually start at verse 15. Because the sermon today is love. But... It says, well, verse 15 says, if you love me, keep my commandments. 
we need to understand that is understanding that if we love him, in other words, he's not saying, if you love me, do what I told you to do. If you love me, keep my commandments because it is a consequence of your love. Loving me will help you to keep my commandments. One of the things that I looked at too is I looked at the commandments that Jesus gave in the book of John. They were things like this, abide with me. Abide with me. Come unto me. They were things like, <clears throat> be with me. Hear me. They weren't all the things that, that, that we normally think about, like, don't kill anybody, or like, um, don't commit adultery, other things like that. He was talking about coming to him, loving him, being with him, embracing him. And you know what happens? Out of that, we won't commit adultery. We won't steal. We won't kill. How could you be with Jesus, embrace Jesus, and then steal and kill? We won't. Obeying his commandments will become the result of you and I loving him. The Bible says in the book of John, chapter 14, So I'm going to start with verse 15. If you love me, keep my commandments, and I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper that, will, that he may abide with you forever. Now, I want you to consider this. Loving Jesus first results in you and I keeping his commandments and results in you and I getting a blessing, a gift from God. That gift is called another comfort. In another place, um, that gift is called a helper. That gift is the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit then is a gift that's given to those who love Jesus. Because when you love Jesus, you obey him. When you obey the gospel of Jesus Christ, that is, when you're baptized into Christ, the Bible says that your sins are removed and you receive the gift from the Lord, the Holy Spirit. And when the Holy Spirit abides in you and I, we are guided unto all truth. And he tells us here that he may abide with you forever. Does forever mean forever? It means forever. So what you and I have to do then <clears throat> is continue to love Jesus. One of the ways to continue to love Jesus is to just look at him. Watch him walk through the gospel. Periodically, I just do that. I will just watch in my mind as I read. Let me show you some of the things that I see. I see that a woman can be taken in adultery, brought by the Pharisees to the temple and humiliated in front of everybody. And Jesus loved her, draw himself to her and tell them, you who are without a sin, let him cast the first stone. And you know what? I believe with all my heart that when he bent down on the ground and he doodled in the sand, that was also an act of love. You know why? He's not standing up looking at them in the face. Their pride may have caused them not to leave. But because of the way love caused him to, to bend down on the ground and doodle in the sand with his finger. The Bible says they went away from the greatest to the least. And when I see that, 
I just can't help but say, wow, in my mind. And it makes me love her more. Did the Pharisees love this woman? They didn't care one bit about her. The whole thing was a trap. And where was the guy? Was she committing adultery by herself? They may, have, they may have even set that up. They were that type of people. Think about it. They didn't like Jesus so much and they were so jealous of Jesus until even when Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead, they were gonna kill Lazarus. They were gonna commit murder to hide the proof that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Who does that? Not the Lord. Verse 18. I will not leave you orphans. I will come to you. What is this about? Think about what's happening here. Jesus just got to telling them that he's getting ready to go. And they're wondering, they're confused about that. They're hurting. They're wondering where he's going, even though he tells them, where I go, you know, but the world doesn't know. He tells them at the beginning of John 14, um, let not your hearts be troubled, you, you believe in me? In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not true, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And he's telling them, you guys don't have to worry. I've been with you. I've walked with you. You've seen me take a couple of loaves of bread and fish and feed a multitude of people. You've seen me heal um, people on the Sabbath day. You've seen me walk on water. You've seen me quiet the elements. You've seen me do these things. You've seen me transfigure. So it would be terribly devastating in their minds if this one who they really still didn't understand who he was were to leave them by themselves. And he says, no, I'm not going to leave you orphaned. What does an orphan need? Parents, for one. An orphan needs parents. So an orphan doesn't have someone to guide them, to protect them, because a parent's role is to protect your children. An orphan doesn't have anyone to, to nourish them. He's saying, I will still be with you. I will protect you. I will nurture you. I will take care of you. I won't leave you orphans. I will come to you. I like that. So when things are going nuts in my life, I remember that. And I can tell you some things right now that just happened within the last 24 hours that would have your mouth wide open. And when I see things like that happen, I think to myself, the devil doesn't want me to preach or something because I have had all kinds of things happen within the last 24 hours, even on the way here this morning. But you know what? I keep remembering the Lord is with me and he's not going to forsake me. And how do I know that? Because he said it and he doesn't lie to me. Amen? I am going to tell you. A person that I know, and I, and I admire this person, they've been stressed out. Don't try to guess because you won't guess. So I, I, I just want to do that and tell you right now. Don't, don't try to, because uh, there's no possible way that you could guess. So, so don't do that. Just hear what I'm going to tell you. They've been so stressed out. They just had, got a new job just recently, and their things were going better for them. They've had difficulties for many years. Because of the stress that they're dealing with right now, they developed some quick mental health issues. And I feel bad for them. I, I, I tried to have a conversation with them tonight. Didn't work because they couldn't hear it because they were in another world almost. And it was sad to see them like that. They even called me and told me some things that a father would never want to hear about their children. And I knew it was because they were having mental issues. 
Herman, you have daughters. And one of the things I really like is you and I talked about daughters before. Herman shared with me one time when you were there with yours and another one was there, there by herself. You know, you know what I'm talking about, don't you? And um, when she was at, try, at some kind of tryout and, and she was there by herself and Herman told me how he felt that the girl didn't have her father there with her. My dad. And um, so Herman, as a father, if all of a sudden you got a phone call and this is what it said to you, Herman, I hate to tell you this, but Rachel is dead. It would kind of freak you out a little bit. I got one of those this morning. So you know what I did? I considered the source. I knew that they were going through troubles. And I was halfway here when I got this call. I said, okay. I hung the phone up and I called my daughter. She picked up the phone. I said, what are you doing? And I talked to her. And um, I shared her with it. I shared it with her. I told her, I said, I knew better. I said, but I just want you to know about that. You see, you and I need to trust God even when we get the crazy things going on in our lives and know that our adversary wants to stop us. And you and I can't stop. You can't afford to stop and the world that God puts you in can't afford to be on hold when God has something for you to do. You do it because God said it and he promised that he'd be with us. He promised that we would not be orphaned. And <clears throat> in addition to that, not being orphaned, he says, I will come to you. Now, I want you to think about that. I will come to you. Well, how's he gonna come? Well, let us continue to read. Verse 19, a little while longer, <clears throat> a little while longer, and the world will see me no more, but you will see me because I live and you will live also. Um, all of these things he, he's saying to them, he has purpose and it's about his love for them. He has purpose so that they can remember these things because if you were in their shoes and I put myself in their shoes, it would be a very, very difficult time right now for what's getting ready to happen. He's getting ready to drive away, guys. He's getting ready to be mistreated. And that's why when it happened that they all went their separate ways because they saw the one who they had hope in, beaten and crucified. And he knows that. And he cares about how they feel. With him telling this, <clears throat> them this ahead of time, when it happens, even though it's going to be shocking to them, they will remember that he told them. They will also remember the hope that they have because of what he had to say. And the fact that he says, but I live and so will you. Because they don't know at this point what's getting ready to happen to them as well. They are getting ready to go through some very, very difficult times themselves. Some of them are going to be mur murdered. And some of them are going to be beaten. All kinds of things are going to be happen with them. They're going to be thrown in prison, but they're able to deal with it because they know it was coming and they, remember, they will remember the fact that he's alive. I want you to think about one more thing. It's real significant about what he's saying. The world won't see me anymore, but you will. In other words, I am going to appear after I die in a locked room with you to show you that I'm risen. I am going to sit and eat fish with you again to show you that I am risen. I am going to allow you to see me ascend into the clouds because I am risen. And then when you deal with the things that you're having to deal with on this earth, remember that you saw me. So when bad things happen to you, remember what I told you. And that's that as I live, 
you will also live again. See, this causes my love for the Lord to grow even greater because he's, his concern is all turned to them, to how they feel, what they're going to be dealing with. He's equipping them to deal with the, uh, the future that's getting ready to happen really quickly. And he's giving them hope, even though our adversary is going to try to turn everything upside down in their life. Have you ever felt like the adversary turn, trying to turn everything upside down in your life? That's right. We all have. And I tell you what we do. We hold on to the Lord. We hold on to the promises of God. Um, we've learned not to be deceived by our adversary in many things. And I say it in many things because he's clever. And he doesn't miss a lick. And he wants you and I to fall. And he's angry. But the Lord tells us to hold on. Verse 20. At that day, you will know that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. What day? Well, I'm not going to tell you what day right now. I want to give you three questions, and I'll go back, and we'll go over that day. The next question, first one is what day? <laughs> the second question is why don't they know what day? Why don't they know what day he's speaking of? Let me answer that question too. Why is it important that they know? We're going to answer all three of those questions here in just a few minutes. Verse 21. So in that day, we'll remember that in that day, you will know, you will know that I am in the Father and you and me and I in you. Verse 21. Here's the point of the lesson. He who has my commandments and keeps them, it is he who loves me. Now, remember what verse 15 says. If you love me, keep my commandments. Verse 21 says it again. When we see things recurring in the scriptures, it's because God is really trying to make the point so that you and I can get it. And this recurrence is said in a different way, but it still says the same thing. Verse 21, he who has my commandments and keeps them is he who loves me. Why? Because your ability to be able to keep those commandments is because you love me. Your love for me has equipped you to be able to keep those commandments. And I have another gift for you, he says here. And he, uh, and um, I will love him and manifest myself to him. Okay? So he will manifest himself to the one who keeps his commandments. He does that with you and I in many ways when, when you and I read in the scripture. And we know how he did it with the disciples because he appeared there with them to be with them physically. Verse 22. Judas, not Iscariot, said to him, Lord, how is it that you will manifest yourself to us and not to the world? You know why, brothers and sisters? Because it is a gift that God has given to you and I. And you and I need to realize that it's a gift that you and I have as his children. Because if you look at the world around us right now, it's just going on its merry way. Like there's no God at all. Like there's no Jesus at all. In fact, the world doesn't even want us to talk about Jesus. and just barely wants us to talk about God. But you and I know better than that. He loves us, and because of his love for us, he made sure that we understand. You and I are so blessed and so equipped for success. I didn't get this for the longest time. This is why I used to be upset. I used to come forward on Wednesday nights asking um, the 
the Lord to help me. I'd come forward on Sundays because I didn't understand. And I was, I was in a congregation where I perceived the people there as having got it, and they had everything together, but Eugene Schwinn doesn't have everything together. And I didn't get it. Now I don't know why God was withholding that from me. He wasn't withholding anything from me. I didn't know. I had become a child of God. But my love was in the process of being developed. When it got to a point, I began to understand. And you know what I realized? It came from walking with the Lord and applying what's written in the Bible. And you know what it's made me, I, I was made me feel about the Bible? My eyesight is diminishing. But I can still read my Bible and I'm happy about that. I can change the font. Well, I can print my Bible out in 14 font. <laughs> and, if, and if my eyes diminish more, I can print it out in 18 font. But I, I, I love his word. I love his word because it's light. I love his word because it's right. It tells me when to turn. It tells me when to stop. It tells me what I need to do. It tells me how I need to um, treat other people. It tells me that the love of God in me helps me see people, which is what we study in the Bible, study this one. Helps me see how special people are to God. It makes people special to me. It helps me to treat people right. It helps me to do right. Look at verse 23. Jesus answered said to him, if anyone loves me, didn't he say this before? So this is the third time. If anyone loves me, he will keep my word. And my father will love him. And we will come to him and make our home with him. Do you realize the significance of, of what was just said? If you love Jesus, God will come to you. And the Lord and be with us and make his home with us. And if he does that, then what in the world is it that I have to fear on this planet? Nada, zilch, nothing. That's right, brother. Nothing. And because of love, perfect love, cast out fear. And I know that he who began to work in, in me will continue it until I leave this world. And guess what? Then I get to be with him. Then I get to be with him. And I want to bring as many people with me as I can because I am so grateful that he reached down and grabbed, I gotta say it like this, the knucklehead in Buffalo, New York and cleaned him up. I'm thankful that he did. Verse 24, he, does not, he who does not love me, well, somebody get that from me. I thought I cut it off. I'm sorry. I left it on the back too. I thought it was off. Just cut it off or put it out in the foyer or something. I'm so sorry. He who, verse 24, you just, you just put it out in the foyer. I, I don't even know how to cut it off. <laughs> I thought it was off. Sorry. Verse 24, he who does not love me, does not keep my words. So he's saying it a different way here. And the word which you hear is not mine, but the Father who sent me. So, so no matter what, everything here goes back to God. And um, loving him makes it where we can keep his word. If we don't love him, he said it again to us another way. So it's all, so it is a product of loving the Lord Jesus Christ understanding him. And now he says, verse 26, well, verse 25, these things have I spoken to you while being present with you. But the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I have said to you. What does this mean for them? 
that they have peace. You and I want to have peace. One of the things that we want so badly in our lives is peace. They had peace because the Holy Spirit dwells with them. You and I have peace because the Holy Spirit dwells with us. And verse 27 says, peace I leave with you. In other words, don't worry about what's, what's getting ready to happen with me. Remember these things that I told you. I'm not going to leave you orphaned. I'm going to make sure that you understand. I'm going to make sure that you have my peace. Um, peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give you. Let not your hearts be troubled when they take me away or what you have to do. Neither uh, let it be afraid. Love will help it not be afraid. If you have heard me say to you, I am going away. I'm coming back to you. If you love me, you would rejoice because I said I am going to the Father. For the Father is greater than I. And now I have told you these things before I come, before it comes. That when it comes to pass, you may believe. Because he loves us. And it's going to give them the hope that they need. It's going to cause these men to go out and do the things that they need to do. Their work traces all the way to you and I. What are you and I going to do? Are you and I going to work? Are you and I going to um, bring hope to people? Are you and I willing to endure? This world needs us. The world that you and I are in right now that's turned upside down with all kind of crazy foolishness is desperate is a desperate need for God's people. Jesus says this: the world may know you because of what? Let me hear it. Because of what? Because of your what? Your love. There you go. Because of your love. Because of your love. Verse 30, I will no longer talk much with you, for the ruler of this world is coming, and he has nothing in me. You know, the ruler of this world tried to kill him when he was a baby to prevent God's love from getting to us. The ruler of this world tried to kill Moses when Moses was a baby, and it was all about Jesus. The ruler of this world is kicked out, and he's mad. And the Bible says, woe unto the inhabitants of the earth, for he's, he's come down to heaven to do war against us, knowing that he has a short time. And the Bible tells us that to overcome is not to love our life unto death, but to love our Lord, to trust our God. Can you do that? I wanted once again, times against me, and I don't need to because enough was said. But if you really want to trace some of what's going on here, in fact, I will just, just take a couple of quick minutes. In the same chapter earlier, there's a conversation that's being said. Many of the answers to that conversation are just answered. Let me find it for you, and I'll, and I'll read it to you. So I'll read it to you. Okay. Verse three. If I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again to receive you um, to myself. That where I am, there you may uh, be also. And where I go, you, uh, you know. And the way you know. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you, uh, where, uh, where you are going. And how can we know the way? Jesus said to them, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the light. No one comes to the Father <clears throat> except through me. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. And from now on, you know him and have seen him. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father and it suffices for us. 
Jesus said to him, have I been with you so long and, you, and yet you have not known me? Philip, he who has seen me has seen the Father. So how can you say, show me the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father's in me? I know what the Lord does here. Because see that, if, if, if you think about what we just got through reading for the last 20 minutes or so, it goes back to this conversation right here. And this is what he says, and I love that he's this way. He says, since, since I've been with you and you don't realize who I really am, and you should, he says, the words that I speak unto you, I do not speak of myself on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does the works. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, or else believe me for the sake of the words themselves. And this is what he's addressing, he's been addressing with them all of this time because they didn't realize who was in their presence. God was in their presence. They saw him and they didn't know. Remember on the road to Emmaus when the men were talking and Jesus appeared to them and says, what is this that you're talking about? And they says, are you the only stranger around here? You don't know what just happened? Jesus, who we thought, <laughs> Jesus, who we thought was the Lord, the Messiah, uh, the Romans took him and killed him. Then Jesus began to take them, show them from the prophets of old. All, and I keep thinking about that, man alive, all that the prophets had to say. And then he says to them, should not the son of man have died? And then, poof, he disappeared out of this sight. And they said, didn't our soul burn within us when he spoke? He was there with them. His spirit dwells in you and I. It's revealing his word to us. He is revealing God's word to us. And God is continuing to work in our lives. And the result of you and I loving the Lord Jesus Christ, we will keep his commandments. I commit this sermon to your hearing, to your understanding. I pray that it has been a blessing to you as much as it has to me, because it has certainly been a blessing to me. And I'm looking forward tonight to tonight because I will give you another part of love. So there'll be a third part. But love leads to repentance. Love leads to salvation. Love gives us the strength to do what we need to do. Love helps us in every way. And it helps us fulfill the great commandment that is to love God with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our mind, and to love our neighbor, our as, our, as we love ourselves and treat people right. If you're not a Christian, then this is an opportunity that God gives you because the invitation belongs to him. It is not ours. And I know men tell us that all we have to do is believe in Jesus. Well, that is the first step. Because if you don't believe, how can you get to where you are sealed? Well, in order to have your sins removed, you must be baptized. There's no other way. So when people tell you that, they need to stop. The devil is happy that he has people standing at the door thinking that everything's well when it isn't. Unless you are born of water and the spirit, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. You cannot. So you must be baptized for the remission of your sins and receive the Holy Spirit according to Acts chapter 2. And the Bible says in Acts chapter 2 verse 47, and the Lord added to his church those who are being saved. So if you're in need, then come. And if you're a child of God and you're in need of prayer, the Bible tells us that the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. We can pray for you. But whatever your need is, won't you come? We'll be together stand and say.
We bow the court close of prayer. All righteous, glorious, gracious, and loving Heavenly Father, how grateful we are that we can give come and there is truly but a small portion of your mighty word. Father, we realize so much of so much of the situations that are beyond our control. All we can truly do is put them into your hands. Their life will destroy the whole family, especially who have been in the hospital. We're grateful to hear that she was going to come out. Lost her struggles. We pray that you continue to be with her and that you help her get back to her physical health. We're all more mindful of those in Haiti. We still, after all the time of the earthquake, we still have not truly really recovered. And now we'll be facing a hurricane, making the damage even far worse. Father, we're also mindful of the people who are traveling here in this church. We ask that you guard, guide, and protect them. 
that brings back, bring it back to us so that they can be here at the next point in time. More than this, Father, I'm so mindful of the fact of your love and just love in general. Let me realize that love never fails. But we also have to realize that love is and what it truly is, is best described in First Corinthians. Moreover, too, Father, we ask the President Biden, the Congress, and the courts that they be granted wisdom to make laws and to interpret those laws as you would have them done. Moreover, too, we pray for the Church of Christ that made around this world that each will contend as one man for the faith and the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we ask too, Father, to guard, guide, and protect us and bring us back to this next service. We ask for all these things in Jesus' holy and righteous name. Amen. Amen. <clears throat>